anthropology, which was too anthropological. anthropological. But Gotten, Gottengum Christology was trying to give religious knowledge objectivity, but his putting the doctrine of Christology with revelation does not achieve objectivity and weakens the foundations of Christology proper. The antithesis and thesis of word and God will not lead to synthesis of dialectical union of the person of Christ, precisely because it's only a possibility, and possibility does not make for objective reality. Bath Christology is also weakened by the ideas of veiling and unveiling of God, that is, God reveals himself in history, but not real history. It might use concrete language, but Bath is really only saying that the divine only touches the man, man Christ. This might seem to contradict Bath's ideas on sacrifice on, on the surface of his teaching, but Bath held tenaciously to the veiling theology, which comes out strongly at Gottingham, but less so in his dogmatics. Quote, Bath's own terms, by mistaking the veil of the flesh for that which it veils, such approaches fail to inquire into what really matters and shut themselves off from the possibility of the veil becoming an open door. End of quote. Next point, living under the shadow of Kant. As the young lecturer, as the young lecturer thundered his theology at Gottingen, he was a John the Baptist crying in the wilderness of liberal theology, a theology sunk in the sand, in the sand of a subjectivity. Barth, with all his brilliance, was going to put the West back on objective theological rock. But as he was doing his theology, just as the liberals lived under the shadow of Kant's philosophy, so he did the same. Bar's whole Christophy with a touch of Ockham thrown in. Ockham believed God by his power can make us have in, in, intuitive knowledge of an object that does not exist. My contention is then that Bath lived under the shadow of Kant. Kant tried to show that religion had nothing to fear from science because reason scientifically considered could not verify religious statements. This is why Bath says the subject cannot know, but the object can make the subject know. The whole of Bath's Christology is foundation found, founded on this. What has happened is objective verification of facts for religion has been destroyed. The historical Christ then is non-verifiable. If Bath would have taken on Neo-Kantian philosophy and not accepted it, then his Christology would have been better off uh, be better off than Kant. He would have been optimistic about human nature, skeptical of, of Prussian morality. Sorry, I'll do that again. If Barth would have taken on Neo-Kantian philosophy and not accepted it, then his Christology would have been better off. Kant, optimistic about human nature, skeptical about knowledge, full of Prussian morality, fail to even think that God could work through history. It is at this point Kant and Barth fail to see the strategic importance of having a Christ rooted in verifiable historical data. Quote, instead of asking how our knowledge can confirm to its conform to its object, we must start from the supposition that objects must conform to our knowledge. Quote, Kenny, page 252. Reformed Theologians I shall now use three theologians to help me be critical of Bar. These reformed theologians have their blind spots, they are not too narrow at times, and they only interact with their own faith community. They are locked, in my opinion, to Hamilton's common sense philosophy. Charles Hodge points out in his systematic theology that Christ's incarnation does not mean that one nature participates in the attributes of the other. No, but rather that the person is the partaker of the attributes of both natures. This means that whatever may be affirmed of their nature, well, it may be affirmed of the person. Now granted that Barth uses the word assumed in his Christology, it is still true because of his veiling ideas to say that Barth's God enters the world and is present within a hypostatically while yet remaining utterly distinct from it by nature. So the old orthodox view of Hodge's hypostatic union and two natures, the sharing of attributes, is simply destroyed. If this is a good point, I don't know, but Bath's view is really, in reality, two natures, no union. Hodge, page 392. I understand this cuts across much of Barthian, Barthian scholarship.
I must take this point further. I think that Barth was clear on the issue of the two natures, but on the union not so. He was using a dialectical method. The Son of God is in eternity, came down to earth, was a dialectical tool. He was using language of orthodoxy as a vehicle for his dialectical program, in, in my view. His hypostatic union was a dialectical cord, not a real divine being. He wanted to bridge the gap between the finite and the infinite, but there was no middle ground. This dialecticism, Van Til notes, quote, It is therefore in line with Burkauer's criticism to say that mutually exclusive view of scripture involve two mutually exclusive views of God and man, and only the Christ of Scripture rather than the Christ of Bath can save us from communism. End of quote. Uh, Van Til, page 135. In my opinion, Bath was in truth more scholastic than reformational. Bath built his Christology on a philosophical basis. It has great strengths in that it gives preeminence to God, but it has great weaknesses that it gets the main points of orthodoxy. Uh, it has great weaknesses. He gets the main point of orthodoxy, but penetrates it with over philosophizing the analogy of faith. Keeping to the Bible in reformational sense would have would have its problems, but it would help to avoid over speculation, which Bart indulges in. Bart on Bart conclusion. The conclusions of this lecture are as follows. Bart's Christology was generally the same throughout his career influenced by his veiling of God idea and Neo-Kantianism. Two, Barth's Christology was essentially orthodox on the surface but realism, it was strong on the hypostatic. It was strong on hypostatic union. The foundations of Barth's Christology were shaky because it failed to interact with culture, it minimized the real history of Jesus, it mixed veiling philosophy with his Christology. Four, Bart was not critical of Kant enough. He never thought, as the Richelians did, that real history could be verified. This means Jesus' life was open to investigation, which means real knowledge of God would be attained. The God is God of Bath was not satisfactory, as it was not grounded in verifiable historical data. Five. This means for all Bath's talk that the Son assumed flesh, it was but a dialectical tool. He never really bridged the gap between the God-man. In the end, Bath's Christology is a scholastic speculation, grand in scope, dazzling in its intellectual thought at the historical point above. It is this point of not grounding his Christology in real history that causes problems for Bath's theology. But Bath will have none of it. Bath's letter, page 168. I wrestle in vain, says Bart, with the question by what right you managed to wrest the doctrine of the revelation of God enacted in Jesus, indeed the very existence and life of God in Jesus, identity with him, on the basis of the figure of your historical Jesus and his message and commitment to God, confirmed by his resurrection from the dead. End of quote. Panning, Panningbird replied in this letter below, I agree with what it says. It also is a good summary of what I have tried to establish, and uh, quote, uh, Bath Letters, P, page 350. It has been my concern not to begin with the generality of socio soteriological anthropology of God-man unity, but rather with a highly particular and unique fact of the historical events of Jesus of Nazareth, end of quote. Okay, uh, these are the references for this lecture. Uh, Karl Barth, Dogmatics in Outline, SCM, London, 1949. Karl Barth, The Gottingham Dogmatics, Volume 1, Erdman's Grand Rapids, 1990. Karl Barth's Letters, 1961-68, to 68, T. T. Clark, Edinburgh, 1981. J. Bowden, Karl Barth, SCM Books, London, 1971. Introduction to the Theology of Karl Barth, T. T. Clark, Edinburgh, 1979, G. Bromley. T. Hart regarding Karl Barth, Paternoster Pater Press, London, 1999. C. Hodge, Systematic Theology, Volume 2, Erdman's Grand Rapids, 1901 to 1993. 1901, republished 1993. Mm -hmm. Mr. Press, 1986. A. Kenny, A Brief History of Western Philosophy, Blackwell, Massachusetts, 1998. A. McGrath, Reckoning with Barth, Mowbray, London, 1998. 
B. McGormack, Karl Barth, Critically Really Critically Realist Dialectical Theology, Clarendon Press, Oxford, 1997. T. Torrance, Karl Barth, Biblical and Evangelical Theologian, T. T. Clark, Edinburgh, 1990. C. Van Til, Christianity and Barthinianism, The Presbyterian and Reform Publishing Company, Philadelphia, 1962. And B. 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 Warfield, Christology and Criticism, Baker Book House, Grand Rapids, 1929. On Karl Barth's scholarship, uh, I would recommend three books to read out of all those. I would recommend B. McGormack's Karl Barth Critical Realist Dialectical Theology, Clarendon Press, Oxford, 1997. The books ever written on Karl Barth's intellectual development. In fact, I think it's one of the best books ever written on Karl Barth. T. Torrance, Karl Barth, Biblical and Evangelical Theologian, um, was an expert in uh, Karl Barth and so I would recommend that you look at him and from a conservative reform position Cornelius Van Til Christianity and Barthinianism uh, is a book that will give you uh, the conservative evangelical just to note the C. Tamville Cornelius Van Til position on Karl Barth is a, is a small minority in the academic world when it comes to Barthian scholarship but um, what what a lot of Bartian scholars don't realize is that Cornelius Van Til was an expert on Karl Barth. Van Til read all of Barth's dogmatics. So when he writes on Barth, he's writing from a very authoritative position. But Cornelius Van Til's scholarship on Barth was ignored by the academic world of Bartian scholars. And uh, that's an injustice and unfair. But yet, yeah, uh, B. McGormack, uh, Karl Barth, Critical Realist Dialectical Theology is an absolutely brilliant book. Uh, Torrance, T. Torrance on Karl Barth uh, was an expert and C. Van Til is an expert from a more reformed evangelical point of view. There are two lectures that you can go and listen to um, by Francis Schaeffer at the Brie Fellowship on Karl Barth uh, on Neo-Orthodoxy. Uh, so if you want to look at Karl Barth's theology, Neo-Orthodoxy, by um, by uh, Francis Schaeffer, is um, two excellent lectures that will help you uh, to think through this issue. Uh, on the Biblical Seminary, there is uh, a department on Karl Barth there uh, with research material if you want to do essays and academic research I think that's perhaps the best place in the world to go to uh, to do a PhD or do research on Karl Barth because uh, they have a, a big reputation at Princeton of having a department on Karl Barth so I hope that's uh, helped to you and I uh, hope it will help you and stimulate you in uh, studying um, the theology of Karl Barth thank you for listening and God bless you